Hello, good morning. Welcome to the last lecture for this course, KM42103 on industrial automations. So today's topic will be introductions to the industrial robots. And as we can see, our last lectures will address the course outcome number six, which is the ability to define and apply knowledge for the development of a uh, start automated system through exposure of or to industrial automations and related technology. So I believe so far you have uh, gone through a different type of uh, automations, uh, so-called technologies. Okay, that will build up the the foundations on what you should uh, practice or maybe apply in your future works. Right. So just a quick to the industrial robots. Okay, so what is industrial robots? So as def being defined by the ISO eight three seven three standards. Okay, it was uh, defined as an automatically controlled, reprogrammable, and multi-purpose manipulator. Programmable in three or more axes, so minimum three, right? Which may be either fixed in place or mobile for use in industrial automation applications so if we say robot then it may not be used in the industrial automation application but then for in the for industrial robots then it should be used in the industrial automation applications so generally, the industrial robots may have the anthropomorphic characteristics, which involve uh, coordinations of control of multiple axes, three or more, maybe six, seven or more than that. It can be in the form of yeah the manipulator itself, and in the industrial robot system okay, itself, it may consist not mainly on the robot but others uh, auxiliary uh, devices okay that helps to complete the task right it also the industrial robots also use dedicated uh, digital computer usually right as the controller it has several advantages for to actually replace human particularly in hazardous or uncomfortable work environment okay for example uh, in a foundry where it is very hot okay that you are dealing with uh, transferring objects to the furnace okay and so on right then also uh, it can be used to perform work cycle with consistency and repeatability okay besides that it is reprogrammable Okay, so these three main characteristics are very attractive in the sense that it can actually do a lot of things at a better efficiency and productivities. But nevertheless, the as you know, to automate a task may not be as simple as it is. Okay, since it is not uh, as intelligent as human, that would be able to uh, complete a task with a lot of sensors with full of sensors from our hand touch sensors okay to visions hearing and other things okay and with our intelligence to make decisions okay so these are the the things that the robot have to uh, complement okay uh, or in order to complete the Okay, the typical production uh, applications for an industrial robots include spot welding, material transfer, okay, particularly in a hazardous uh, environment, machine loading, spray painting, and assembly. Okay. Yeah, again, that's that uh, diagram shows is uh, industrial robots. Okay, for up welding, okay, which you can see is being supported with a lot of uh, equipments okay that actually do the welding itself right so here is the 
some vocabularies okay that you I, I've extracted from the ISO standards okay on manipulating industrial robots okay it defines the terms robotics what it is okay the practice of designing building and applying robots then in the robot system it's not only consists of the robot but as uh, it's also consists of the end effector and any equipment devices that helps the robot to perform its task okay also you will need other communication interface okay to actually communicate in between the robots okay as uh, monitoring to operate as well as to run other peripheries uh, devices supervised by the robot control system right now come to the robot anatomy so in this robot anatomy as we say uh, it's intent to replace human meaning to say main task to replace human is the physical task for time being okay because it doesn't have the so-called intelligence so far and it doesn't have the the kind of senses that human have so the main uh, task that it can replace is the physical task which is being com which involve the use of manipulator or hand okay we want to manipulate an object or to do certain tasks on the object okay using the so-called uh, industrial robots therefore uh, there are several uh, components or sections that com completes a robot okay or an industrial robot itself it start with the base right so you can see there is a base at the bottom okay which referring to refers to the stationary body or link that are mounted to the ground so usually we may label that as a link zero okay then connecting between one movable axis to another movable axis we use a link or a body okay we refer that as a link and that is the rigid components of a robot manipulator for sure as you can see in industrial robots we still use a very rigid link okay just like we have a bond okay we need a rigid link okay to actually do the support to perform the task of the manipulator the hand itself okay so next would be the joint or the axis so this would be the the part where it's control the degree of freedom within the robots so each joint will provide one degree of freedom so you just have to count how many joints that a robot has then it will provide that number of degree of freedom right so each of the joint we assume it would give one degree of freedom since we are dealing with a mechanical type of joint right so this joint is actually connecting two links together while providing this kind of movement degree of freedom so that degree of uh, that kind of joints can be actually um, I would say categorize or yeah categorize into several types mainly uh, on the linear and a rotational type of joint right so the first two would be a linear type and the three others are the rotational type of joint right so you have type L type O type R type T and type V so the type L and type O is those so-called translational right means you can see this is a prismatic type okay so it's extruded in and out of the previous arm okay along along the axis of the the so-called links itself whereas for this type O it looks like sliding right because it, they have maybe an orthogonal type of a link okay sliding on the surface of the previous link right so 
looks similar actually okay then for the three other type of rotationals basically are rotations okay about the previous link right so you can see about a previous link for these two case okay only the next links is actually either connected parallel to it or orthogonal to it okay and the next one would be the rotational axis actually uh, normal or perpendicular to both links okay so this both link reflects like this right then in the robots or the I would say industrial robots itself except the SCARA configurations they usually have three or more three or six degree of freedom sorry three or six usually either three or six okay these configurations would uh, consist of two sub assembly I would say the first three degree of freedoms will form the so-called arm right so this is the the arms okay which you can see from the base you can rotate okay then you have a lower arm and the upper arm just like our our hand right so we have a shoulders okay then we have the lower arm and the upper arm right since it is located like this right so lower arm and the upper arm then to manipulate or to orientate the end part right therefore we would have another three degree of freedoms to provide those uh, so-called uh, flexibility in the spherical form okay we call it as a wrist sub assembly mm, that's again consists of three degree of freedoms right so you have these three degree of freedoms that manipulates or orientates the man here I would put a mechanical interface but this would refer to the end effector right so uh, why I put a mechanical interface here because in this design itself uh, the robots doesn't it's a uh, industrial robots where this part okay where it's connect to this welding torch there is a interface just a plate with a standard uh, hole okay again you can refer to various uh, I would yeah standards or maybe um, yeah the standards okay where they use for industrial robots they have depending on the size of this industrial robot they have a mechanical interface which they will provide four screwing uh, sc screw uh, locations and a bigger one may be have six and eight okay so there is a mechanical interface at there that you can connect or change your end effector tools okay so you may put a welding torch there a spot welding torch a uh, spot welding gun spray gun or whatever tools at the end of it right and this tools itself we would say it as an end effector right the at the end itself it's perform the so-called task that you would want to do if it is just for holding a work piece then that in end effector is usually a gripper okay gripper type whereas for others uh, process like up weldings spray paintings maybe assembly right you may need to drill or maybe you need to put a screw okay screwing then you may need to put a tools and that tools would be your end effector right here are several typically uh, typical industrial robot configurations they are I guess five or six of them the first one would be the articulated or joint arm robot so this is the typical the most commonly uh, available industrial robots especially in the automotive industry okay where it's similar to a human shoulder and arm okay it consists of an upper body that swivels about the base using the T joint then you have two rotating uh, 
upper link and the lower link okay that's perform the articulations just like the human arms then the second one would be the polar configuration so so in this polar configurations you can see that the base can rotate then the first joint can rotate up and down okay then the third joint is a prismatic type right so you have two rotations and one prismatic okay so this we create the polar configuration just like the polar polar graphing or polar coordinates right so if you are dealing with uh, with this kind of polar configuration robot then the coordinates of the locations or your object if it is being expressed in polar coordinates that would be much more easier for you to program later on okay then for a SCARA robot SCARA robot stand for selectively compliance arm for robotics assembly so mainly this is uh, created for robot assembly you can see that these two sites provide the rotations but in the plane form right in the plane form instead of uh, moving up and down okay so they are moving in a plan right then at the end part okay again this is in a prismatic form okay going down and up so they have a certain kind of compliance to uh, I would say perform the task which involve insertions task okay insertions putting com electronic electronic components okay putting a drill okay and other things so this will provide a very strong type of I would say mm, yeah strong support okay when you pu push it down okay instead of you depending on the motor to provide the holding torque okay so this configurations have this advantages that they they are rigid in the vertical vertical directions okay but provide a so-called compliance flexibility to move in the horizontal directions others uh, basic com configurations would include the Cartesian's coordinate robots okay so this one is a uh, basic robots just like the gantry robots okay you have the X Y and Z coordinates okay so all three axes are linear joints okay so they just move in X Y and Z directions and usually or commonly used for overhead assess uh, particularly for loading and unloading of a part alright that's uh, it allows maybe an open 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 type of productions where you don't have anything on the top so you can easily go up and down right then on the Delta robot as well we expect this is uh, usually on the hanging on the top okay you have the overhead base okay but then this have uh, I would say two links okay but these two links only the first links is being controlled right so this link is being powered by a motor over here okay whereas the other links is is just a, a flexible link that are connected no no motor is exist over here okay so there there is three three links okay at the base the advantages of this uh, configuration is that all the motors are located at the base and this uh, save a lot of uh, I would say energy okay by shifting the load of the motors to the base okay instead of putting the loads at each of this joint okay so if you put some loads over here then this motor will need a higher power to actually uh, move it right so by putting three three motors over here and at the end of it you put an arm and connect them therefore by controlling these three motors this platform will actually orientate 
by itself okay to a certain uh, orientations that you would desire it to be right so this del delta uh, robots again it would be useful for yeah orientations as well as a uh, maybe a small objects uh, placement in packaging or maybe yeah putting components right which which it also involve a very high speed movement right but then since uh, they are hanging and so on so we don't expect a very high high payload meaning to say the object that you intend to to lift up and put it down and so on may be a just a small object okay so these are the again some vocabulary from the ISO standards on the primary axis or we call it as arm then secondary axis also we call it as wrist okay then there is a configurations the terms called configurations they also define articulated or anthropomorphic uh, robots okay which refers to the most typical part okay the one that uh, similar to the human's arm and the SCARA robot right so these are the definitions okay, based on the ISO okay then come to the risk configuration as we have seen uh, previously those configurations that we present previously mainly have the three degree of freedom that three degree of freedom actually used to positions the I would say positions the end effectors or to positions the wrist itself okay just like our hand we want to position this particular point okay we want to locate it at a certain point whereas the manipulations of the object whether you want to put it at to the left or right and so on okay that task we usually assign it to the wrist okay therefore in the three dimensional space itself the minimum degree of freedom should be six okay minimum degree of freedom should be six you have three linear or translations and uh, another three rotational uh, movement or degree of freedom that complete a three dimensional uh, degree of freedom okay but then in robots itself okay we intend to save as much as possible in terms of uh, optimizations or to optimize it for the applications of our task okay therefore it depends if we intend just to do a loading unloading things okay meaning to say we just have to lift it up and lift it down where you don't need much of the orientation then three degree of freedom we uh, is sufficient okay but sometimes you may need four degree of freedoms and so on okay only when you would like your industrial robots to operate in a more open space uh, environment okay to perform tasks that's really simil similar to the human hand Okay, for example, in automotive uh, industry where they intend to do spot welding, arc welding, and so on. Okay, then in that particular cases, you may need uh, at least six degree of freedom. Okay, why more than six degree of freedom? I will uh, in I will tell you later on. Right. So here, for the wrist itself, okay, this sub assembly you again consists usually consists of three degree of freedom to provide again the three uh, required rotational uh, movement okay and it is actually established the orientation you can see to establish the orientations of the end effector typically again you need two or three but three is the best okay that's involved maybe three kind of uh, movement or we would say axis there okay so one is a pitch okay moving up and down right then row okay so usually we we will intend to use a uh, pitch and row okay these two movement okay yaw uh, 
we even uh, our wrist seldom use this movement right but sometimes we may need it okay to complete certain tasks right so we have this three uh, axis to to form a wrist sub assembly right so you can see we can form this uh, sub assembly over here right so how to put this into or how we would able to power this wrist is through mainly uh, our mechanical design okay so you can see that this is a three axis uh, wrist okay but that have been designed for for up welding robot right so this is actually a up welding industrial robots all right with uh, we call it as spherical wrist okay what is the difference between spherical wrist and non spherical wrist is that you can see in this configurations this axis this pitch axis doesn't cross the yaw axis okay but this row axis will cross two of them meaning to say there are two axis that actually doesn't intersect that would create a work volume like a non spherical form right if we are able to form something like this okay which each of the axis okay that three axis actually going or intersect at this one particular common point then in that case we would able to achieve a spherical uh, work volume okay in so you can see that this design would be able to achieve that particular uh, spherical as you can see they are at the common common point over this point okay the movement of this pitch is actually being controlled by a motor over here through a belt okay so controlling the pitch motions then for this particular motions okay so this rolling so called rolling motions okay or maybe yaw motions i don't know so this motions actually being put at the back all right so the whole the whole arm actually can twist right then the last part would be this mechanical interface also rotating about this axis which coincides with this right so this is being powered again by through belts and uh, bevels gears right so you can see how it can be uh, designed next would be the joint drive system okay so typically in order to power our joint we would want to select uh, some actuators okay it can be in the form of electrical hydraulic or pneumatic in commercial robots or industrial robots usually we would prefer electrics nowadays because of the ease of control as well as it is much cleaner right so you can see that electric uh, type of joint drive are readily adaptable to the computer control and also they are more accurate in terms of uh, yeah in terms of control itself whereas for hydraulic we st still need it okay especially when the robots require a very high payload capacity what it means by payload in in robot is that your your object have a certain weight okay so if your object is 100 kilogram so in order for your robots to actually lift it up means your robot have a payload of maybe 1000 newtons okay so you must be able to lift it up that would be the payload the capacity to manipulate 
the object itself, right? But that is based on the static form, right? In order to perform the task according to our desired uh, motions, we would have to design such that it's not only satisfy the static conditions, but it's also have to set satisfy the kind of dynamics uh, conditions. For example, it must able to accelerate. Okay, when you come to the terms accelerate, then you have to to multiply with accelerations f equals to m a, right? So you have to come multiply with the kind of accelerations to provide that kind of uh, uh, power not only li slowly lift it up but have to move that 100 kilogram at a certain speed okay so that that would be the the challenge okay in terms of the drive system whereas for a uh, smaller robots you may a uh, you may use a pneumatic type of drive system okay since they are they are i would say less uh, leaking okay problem so even they leak is only air therefore it is suitable for a small robot okay where the precision or accuracy may not be that I would say critical right so as you remember pneumatic drive have the have that uh, accuracy problem so as long as it reach certain point to perform certain tasks then that would be great then you may able to select this pneumatic type of a uh, system okay so in order for you to do the selections okay you may first consider the payload or the load carrying capacities okay and also the dynamic response characteristics okay that includes uh, the positions the so called the speeds the accelerations that you would want your system to perform right also is because of the feedback control systems that usually exist in the joint itself remember feedback control system you have learned so called being exposed to this term in the control systems uh, subject or course before okay so you have that kind of looping okay behind it how fast they, they actually respond to that uh, particular uh, imp signal input signal okay before it actually reach the final positions right motions considerations would includes the motion speeds okay which may be at the speed of two meter per second okay for a very high speed okay then the speed of response okay the time the settling time okay sometimes uh, your manipulator or your arm will you actually overshoot remember the terms overshoot when you flex to to a certain uh, angle it ha it may overshoot before it come back to the to the desired target or positions okay that that speed of response then also the motion stability which yeah i would say the overshoots itself again uh, how much it oscillates okay and we say uh, the stability okay then on the end effectors so this end effector as I've mentioned previously it can be uh, formed depending on the type of object or task that you intend to perform okay it's two main categories one is grippers and the other ones would be the tools for the grippers it is used to grab and manipulate the object from one particular location to the other in this case uh, they would say in the cell okay during the work cycle what it means by in the cell itself is that usually uh, in the industrial robots application they will put them in the cell okay remember uh, we have come to the sections where I put some safety issues okay safety considerations okay where you would want to separate the workspace of the robot and the human okay you don't want the human accidentally move to the place where the robot arm will swing across your hair your head 
okay so they there is a cell okay where that robots will do their work okay they will swing around in that particular cell so this this gripper will do the work okay inside that particular cell itself okay that uh, grippers would be used mainly on the loading and unloading applications and it depends also on the object shapes size and weight okay so if you have different kind of object for example you have a bottles then your design of grippers may be different right but if you intend to to uh, bring a tofu then the mechanical grippers design is again different right so that would depends on the object shape that you intend to manipulate right so again you can see that uh, in the industrial robot application there are mechanical gripper very common mechanical gripper which consists of two or more finger okay so the most typical one is uh, two two finger okay then also you may want to use a vacuum gripper to vacuum cups okay so that you can hold on or move the cups okay lift it up and down as long as the cup have a flat surface um then also if the parts have ferrous uh it's a ferrous material then you can use magnetic device you can also use adhesive type of device okay and as well as the very simple hook okay you just hook simple mechanical device just hook it bring it up if there is a a kind of uh yeah another hook that on the object that you can easily hook on okay if you are dealing with sand then you for sure you need a scope and so on right so this is how you have to design or select the end effector according to the type of object that you intend to manipulate okay so these two figures actually uh, taken from a conference that I've attended in Korea which is a uh, presented by a Japanese professor where they doing a research on uh, what is this? palm okay palm okay which consists of five fingers okay they have studied all those kind of uh, way how all these fingers are related okay so they are able to actually open the water bottles bring it up without squeezing out the waters okay so the selections of the force are important then also their robots can actually lift up a tofu without breaking it okay and put it on a plate and so on okay so these are the things that you have to consider the type of uh, uh, object that you intend to deal with then on the tools side it is intent to uh, to perform the type of processing operations on the workpiece okay? so that end effectors now your arms your industrial robots now be is only to manipulate the tools okay that tools can be anything from a arc welding torch okay as well as a spot welding gun right so this is a spot welding gun this is a arc welding torch so this is just a bracket okay so this is your torch then we have a, a wire feeding mechanisms okay all the way back to the to the base right so this robot now is not only uh, required to do the manipulations okay but it's also need to communicate with the controller that involve the start stop and regulating the actions of your tools uh, during the operation so you may want the robot to manipulate uh, reach a certain positions then it will start the operations of maybe a spray painting or other things okay so that is the start stop and the regulations of the actions the many applications uh, especially those where 
it is hazardous the environment is hazardous dangerous okay not fancy then uh, we would want it to be replaced using this uh, industrial robots start involve like a uh, spot welding guns you can see how big this spot welding gun it's easily go up to 10 to 20 kilogram right so imagine you want to do the the kind of spot welding okay or Ar around the the frame of your car okay so this is commonly used in uh, automotive okay welding on the car so it would for sure if it is being performed by human due to the tiredness the environment itself you the welding quality will drop okay after some times whereas for the robot it is very consistent at they they usually never miss a single point okay if they miss certain points then your controller should able to detect it all right then also the arc welding tools okay spray painting you don't want to do a spraying in of the car okay because since it's again full of chemicals okay you have to wear a mask and so on right then also rotating spindles for drilling routing grindings and other similar operations that are very tight you need to push okay and keep doing it repeatedly right so uh, even assembly tooling okay like screwing hitting touch okay and other water jettings they are maybe some of them are easy but then if you need to orientate it to a certain type or certain uh, positions using human then that may not be uh, good enough right so in the case of two change is required then this end effectors may take a form of fast fast uh, changing two holders okay to release okay that's why you have a mechanical interface okay that you can ac actually change your tools okay automatically or maybe manually okay up to you uh, during the works cycle for the work volume so this work volume actually uh, there are many other terminologies you may also heard about work envelopes okay in this uh, from Wikipedia they call work area or whatever it is okay so this work volumes define the area where the the end of this uh, risk will actually manipulate okay you want to know where is the area that it can swap around okay so it, it is in the form of three-dimensional okay so this uh, work volume actually depends on the robot configurations due to the movement maybe translational or rotational type of joint so the work volume may have different forms okay for articulated one is a partial spherical so you can see this partial spherical not a complete spherical polar also a partial spherical whereas for scara is a uh, cylindrical cartesian is a uh, rectangular and the delta is a hemisphere okay so that kind of uh, work volume so when you come to selections of the the industrial robots okay so again you have to make sure that your work piece that you intend to operate must fall in this work volume okay so that will also affect how much uh, stations that you can have around your your robots okay you may one maybe one robots per cell or maybe you one one cell may consist four robots six robots okay so they cooperate with each other so again when they cooperate with each other that work volume may if you want you can actually separate it so that they will not interfere each other or if you want them to call exist together because now uh, come to the point where you may in one more than six degree of freedom for example uh, you have a glass over here okay and you want to put certain things on into the 
a glass okay without touching it okay directly to the bottom so if you put directly it may not able to do it okay so you may want to orientate the better way sometimes you have a space limitation so you may want to also turn this glass tilt this glass together so you may need two uh, robot arms to work together it can be another part would may maybe a robotic arm as well or maybe a I would say uh, automated or numerical control NC type of manipulator okay or positioner yeah positioner towards okay so you can position your workpiece okay your which is being held by a fixture so that your your robotic arm actually can reach very uh, uh, specific point okay because your torch have a certain limitation so you may need another device okay the positioner to positions the workpiece okay uh, to make your your operations much more easier for example a certain operation like um, you let's say spray painting you may not want to spray it from the bottom okay you may want to spray it from the top or the side because the the paint may may drop somehow okay if you put it on the bottom so what happen if you want to spray at the bottom you have to reorientate your your object somehow okay to to make sure that you achieve the desired uh, results here is again few vocabularies that includes the two center point okay these two center point refer to the point uh, which with regards to the mechanical interface coordinate system okay TCP then we also have this mechanical interface that to refer to the mounting surface at the end of the articulated st structures then again we have the end effectors which is being defined or referred as the device specifically designed for attachment to the mechanical interface okay to enable the robot to perform their particular task in robots again since we need it to have the kind of feedback okay you want it to reach a certain positions with satisfactory accuracy okay adequate uh, accuracy therefore you may need sensors to deal with it okay they can be two type internally which is part of the component of the robot okay for example it's potentiometer tachometer or optical encoder okay that uh, has been being part of the robot so usually you can see this as uh, in the servo motor okay so those electric electric um, yeah electric joints okay powered by electric uh, motors they have servo motor with optical uh, sensors and so on so at the end again they have certain uh, sensors to make sure that it match together okay by by doing that kind of calculations right externally you may also need certain uh, sensors to coordinate that kind of operations like limit switch okay that's uh, if it reach certain certain if you orientate okay then when it reach uh, the limit switch then it will uh, stop and so on that can be in the form of safety or sometimes it is just as very simple as a limit switch or proximity sensors to tell the robot okay this is a stop point okay since you want to program it just like the the normal industrial automations technique okay for the robot control system again uh, as we have mentioned usually they are controlled using computer nowadays and that computer actually consists of microprocessor okay so it can be the kind of uh, the computer or microprocessors okay that's control each of the joints so each of this joint will have their own feedback control system
okay so if you have six join then each of them will have their own con feedback control system and being supervised by a controller so this controller will tell us where, where is the positions or rotations required by each of these joints they will send the signal to all joints simultaneously okay and tells them to move okay according to the desired motions okay in order to do this kind of uh, operations okay or coordinations you need a robot program okay and besides that you may categorize the robot controller into four types okay limit sequence control okay which is the basic limit switch type of uh, operations or controller then playback with p2p uh, control point to point control or playback with continuous path control and the last one would be the intelligent control so you can uh, control your robots okay how they want one how they would want to send the signal okay according to these four methods okay either of these four methods so the limit sequence controls would be the simplest one okay it can be like a 3d printer okay which they have since this is a like a Cartesian this is actually a Cartesian robot you can say that okay they have X Y and Z uh, coordinates right so the control of this is actually based on the limit switch so if I would say that uh, I put a limit switch that every time it reach a certain the first limit switch then it will stop and do the second task so that would be the kind of limit sequence control just like the 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 assignments that I have give to you okay so at certain stage when certain things pass through okay or certain object touching it then you would uh, do the next operations okay so this is the idea of this so-called limit sequence control okay it can be as simple as that then that would be uh, useful for a pick and place operations picking up from one location to another okay so then the next one would be the playback okay playback means you record the motions okay or certain particular points okay then you play it back so that's why we call this kind of control as playback okay with two way okay either point to point control or continuous path control so if we intend to play back with point to point control mean to say the robots will only save certain point you just move the robot and tell point A to point B okay or coordinate A to coordinate B so the robot will do whatever they can okay based on whatever they like okay to move from point A to point B right so in between the path you you are not controlling okay so that is the point to point control whereas for the continuous path control you intend to do certain type of uh, interpolations okay you want to interpolate from point one to point two maybe through a straight line or a curve arc uh, a spine line and so on so that would be the the kind of continuous path control so if you intend to use the continuous path control then the robot controllers memory have to be increased right so they they actually being stored in the memory in the form of sequence and they will record like locations in the set in the in the sense of point to point control and for the continuous path then they will also record the speed of the joint rotations for every single uh, sing every single time I would say okay throughout the the work cycle yeah throughout the execution of the program in order to achieve the continuous path okay that you intend to control okay sometimes you may also need uh, to use interlock okay in between them to coordinate certain actions okay meaning to say after certain things done 
okay for example you have two robots operating to the same same object okay so you may need a certain over overlock a uh, interlock sorry to do to coordinate between robots okay the actions of the robots or whatever okay so after certain things done then we would activate this interlock so that the next action can take place okay it can be other robots taking place or other operations or other program being loaded okay to to do that particular things next would be the robot control system okay yeah so yeah we still at the robot control systems sorry uh the difference between the continuous path and the uh, play plot point to point control systems as I've mentioned uh, they need greater storage capacity and in between them you the continuous path control may need the interpolation calculation so internally they have so-called stored uh, mathematical functions okay to tell point A to point B using straight line function so they, they will do the kind of interpolations routines or program okay to do to do the calculations and perform that particular task right then for the uh, fourth type of controller or uh, con control type would be the intelligent control okay and this is what we we always uh, desire okay this includes uh, but not limited to the capacity to interact with the environment make decisions okay when something goes wrong okay and also communicate with human telling human uh, what is wrong okay make uh, computational during motion cycles and respond to advanced sensor like uh, visions okay so you may have a heated object okay you put a vision machine visions okay so that they they can process that visions do ki the kind of uh, processing and and operates accordingly right again if we intend to use the intelligent control it requires a very high level of compute control I believe nowadays this uh, will not be the limitations as uh, as we can see that our mobile phones have the processing power as good as the PC nowadays right so nowadays this kind of intelligence control is is just our ability as the programmer to actually incorporate our ideas in into it okay besides the cost the money right then uh, now come to the applications of industrial robots we have a uh, several type of categories okay three types of categories so the first one will be the material handling the major one okay then the second one would be the processing operations and the third one assembly and inspections for the material handling applications robot will move materials from one point to the other with grippers okay that involve material transfer or material material loading and unloading material transfer means putting one object to the other object okay machine loading and unloading meaning you have a machines already you want to put object into your machines and take it out from your machines okay so there are advantages as we say this kind of material handling are highly repetitive and usually boring and sometimes if your object is heavy okay means they maybe you want to transfer a big object okay from one point to another maybe one conveyor belt to the next conveyor belt then may become dangerous all right something's hot right so in the material transfer applications usually you just need two to three degree of freedom okay therefore 
if the object is small enough then you can actually use the pneumatic type of joint to do that type of operation also you can use the delta robots okay this kind of uh, work uh, would includes like pick and place operations you may want to put object from one conveyor to the other or maybe you want to put uh, electric electronic component to your circuit board okay before your circuit board being transferred to the to the soldering uh, machines okay so you want you may want to have this kind of pick and place operations then also palleting the palleting palleting and the palleting is uh, you would want to move you have a, a pallet okay like a box okay you want to arrange the object on the pallet okay so in this case your object will shift locations okay maybe you have a uh, point one okay the first object that you grab you put it here second object you grab you put it, uh, to the next point okay third object you put okay so that is called palleting so it may involve slightly more slightly more complex because of the different positions that you want to uh, place your object okay the palleting is taking it out okay away again from different locations to to one locations then stacking is when you have your object okay stack to the next one okay so the operations the or the locations will now keep increasing or keep decreasing okay insertions is the is the putting components into into certain holes or compartment okay right then for the machine loadings and unloading this is where uh, the hazardous uh, environments dangers comes in okay here there are several applications for example die casting which is a uh, sometimes maybe very hot very cold whatever it is so you may not want to use human to actually do all these things okay so you may want to use your uh, robots to do this di die casting unloading the object from the die cast machines okay then also plastic molding you may want to melt the plastic okay into the certain form mold it okay then take it out so when you take it out the plastic is still hot so if you use human human can do the work okay but they use glove right so this is not a, a good environment to work with usually okay then metal machining operations like uh, putting blanks into the machine tools okay which may be very heavy metals and other things okay so then also forging which includes uh, putting a hot billets you may want to uh, somehow burn the rods okay just like the car axles okay you may want to put a normal cylinder road okay burn it until it, it become red hot then you transfer this uh, hot billets to the die then you you do the forging to to press so that it reforms the kind of uh, shapes that you want okay previously without machines human is the one who do all these things okay at the very hot furnace they just bring it out and put to the to the other part then the machines will do whatever they they need to to hammer it to forge it right but if possible then now robots have uh, comes into pictures okay to replace all this uh, hard work then also press working heat treatment or heat treatings okay this are the place where you don't want human to work at there I would say okay because of the hazardous or dangerous nature of hot uh, environment okay everything is still burning there okay or maybe very noisy then the second applications or second categories of applications will be the processing operations which includes a spot welding spray painting art weldings okay and others rotating uh, spindle operations or 
or process. Okay. So again, this kind of uh, operations would require a material handling device. Okay. This kind of material handling device, as I mentioned, you need you may need to orientate them. Okay. Or in a way, just like your assignments. Okay. That I give. You are actually doing certain type of material handling by make sure the object may be always standing. Okay, if it is not standing, then you just categorize into there so that when the object come to the robots, it is already in a certain uh, orientations. Okay, so you may need a material handling device to actually deal with your if with your object before you let the industrial robot to to work on it okay so the advantages again would protect the human from hazardous environment better uh, quality productivity uniformities in terms of weldings okay and spray paintings then also because of uh, of involving materials then you can also reduce waste as robots are more efficient when they stop they stop okay in between uh, they may not waste a, a lot okay like humans okay so also uh, since uh, we are dealing with robots the safety requirements are also being reduced okay such as ventilations so in the robot work cell you don't need to provide that kind of uh, ventilation suitable for human to operate so you know uh, in the factories like uh, in Malaysia we are governed by the factories act okay and others act there are regulations that in those workspace they are minimum a change per hour meaning to say the the type of ventilations you you need to provide okay so once uh, you replace it with, with robot then you you have reduced your scope of ventilations okay here is uh, the applications for spot welding again it may require five to six degree of freedom depends on the complexity of your object then the end effect is your spot welding gun to pinch and then you they will put in to a very high power okay to melt two pieces together okay to uh, so that they are joining together and they the gun itself is very heavy okay so you may want to select or deal with the heavy payload okay so in this kind of uh, applications you be only needs a point to point control usually all right so point to point from one point to another point because spot welding is just by point okay so you may just want from one point to the next point and so on okay so you can achieve this by using a joint arm robot the second one would be the arc welding again five to six degree of freedom is sufficient but again depends on the type of task you you need okay the complexity of the task in this arc welding you will need a continuous well therefore um, the type of control that you need is a playback robot with a continuous path control right in this case also you may need a fixture or positional to mechanically uh, orientate your your object okay so that it's face the right face for your robot to operate okay so usually they they are contained in the cell okay which consists of the robot the welding apparatus and the fixture or positioner okay this would increase the up on up on time okay this up on time for a human is about 20 to 30 percent only meaning to say if you ask a human to do this uh, up welding okay so the humans will only turn on the the welding gun maybe 20 percent of their their working time okay if we, they work one hour they actually taking up the, the the gun okay locating the right positions and putting the the kind of weld 
is only 20%. The rest is the manipulating object and other things. So if we can replace it with the robot, then it will tremendously increase to 60 to 80%. Depends on the the programming or the complexity of the task that you may need. Okay, so if you continuously work on it, then the next next object can come into and wait for it. Right, so this kind of uh, operation since uh, it may be complicated then uh, we can actually program it okay directly from the cat model okay where you have the well path okay remember nowadays uh, those cat software they also uh, support wellman and they that wellman's uh, join that you assign to your cat model they will detect as the point to well right so once you they they detect as a point to well they actually can generate the the numerical control code or the G code okay the final positions where you would want it to be orientated okay so they they already have this kind of uh, uh, progress okay after 20 30 years okay of trying right then also the for the spray coating again five to six degree of freedoms where you want to direct the spray gun to the object to be coated. The end effectors would be the spray gun itself. Okay. Then uh, applications would be the car bodies. Okay. Maybe engine parts and wood or whatever we is. Okay. Particularly uh, a big object. Okay. So if it's involving a big object, then your robots may may you may use maybe three to four robots to complete the the spraying of your car okay or you may you may use uh, one single robot but then your robot station is moving okay so it depends on the capital or the cost capaci capability that you have okay either you you can buy more than one robot or not okay so it depends all right so again since spray painting involves movement okay the distance between uh, your the end effectors the spray gun and the object is important to make sure the uniformity okay therefore uh, continuous path control is required and usually we will do this through a manual lead through okay manual lead through uh, is using human control right so I will tell later on other processing applications would include drilling grindings water jettings okay similarly okay you just change the end effector to the tools that you require okay so what are the design considerations again the design considerations would be including your payload the type of uh, say motion response that you may need right so these are the things that you always uh, consider first okay before you start to design for your robot okay for the case of assembly and inspection applications it involves handling of materials or the manipulations of the tools which is maybe your screwdriver okay and so uh, no sorry uh, yeah, screwdriver for assembly, maybe a glue gun for assembly, or maybe the inspections, a camera, or maybe a, a prop, okay, to make sure the, maybe the depth of the hole is correct, okay, the width of the, the hole is correct, that kind of, of inspections, okay, you may want to man manipulate your, your, your tools, okay. For the case of assembly, then it's just to combine multiple components into one. So you may want to fasten them together. Whereas for the inspections, you need to have a higher positions, okay? Because you are dealing with sensor. If your your robot is not uh, precise or accurate, then whatever you measure may not be accurate as well. Okay, so that's why the accuracy is uh, important okay when you come to the inspections operation 
uh, therefore usually in the for the inspections we would want that uh, more the kind of robot configuration configuration that are more rigid for example uh, the Cartesian type okay or the SCADA type okay which is more rigid on a certain form okay so that uh, the position is much more higher okay so this is uh, assembly uh, robots okay which again consists uh, about three to four degree of freedoms you may need it okay three to three of degree of freedom so this is the scar scara robot okay this is the normal articulated robotic arm okay so the assembly will involve a uh, combining several parts together okay and the robots are usually at a disadvantage okay in the high production situations okay so if you want to to produce the same object again with a lot of units okay then you may not consider using robot okay as you have learned previously in the introduction i guess depending on the on the quantity that you intend to produce okay therefore the selections may make more sense from the economical uh, view of point right so if you intend to use robot then therefore the the quantity may be moderate okay but then you have multiple multiple parts or objects or product yeah or product that you may want to deal with okay so for example you may have especially nowadays they may use uh, the same components for different product for example you have phone from yeah phone from maybe company a and company a produce 10 model of phones okay model a b until until a b c d e f g h uh, 10 10 model of it okay but then the processor is the same okay even though train 10 different model different positions okay different size okay but the the component of the processor is you still use certain cpu okay so therefore this this kind of operations you may consider uh, industrial robot because you may want to assembly the same component to different different products okay i would say right so this kind of uh, assembly task you need maybe uh, just a point to point control whereas for other applications okay uh, may include the instruct sorry the inspections operations will include uh, make sh making sure the process have completed or the assembles has been assembled as specified or to identify whether there is flaws at the finished part as well as the raw material you have to check whether the raw material is correct before you you put it on to your assembly right so these are the applications okay from the economic uh, justifications whether you want to use uh, an industrial robots or not okay that would uh, come from different perspective okay but for sure the perspective would be from the money okay the economical side is this okay so if you earn large enough then you may start to consider putting humans uh, benefits first okay so you may want to replace humans or yeah substitute humans from the hazardous worst work or repetitive work cycles okay so that they can uh, do better works okay then uh, yeah di difficult handling of the tools heavy tools okay so these three are the main usually the main motivations okay because of the safety and other matters so these three generally is the main factors okay to select an industrial robots okay 
whereas the others would be the sub uh, justifications where if you have an operations that require multiple shift okay you have eight to five shift okay and then five to maybe 12 shift and then 12 to 8 shift, 3 shift or maybe 2 shift then a robot may provide a much faster financial payback okay because one robot will now if 2 shift one robot will replace 2, two human or one robot will replace 3 humans okay so that would make more money sense okay when you select a robot then all others would include like the part positions and already orientations of the things have already established okay you already have a conveyor belt that uh, are being so called uh, put at the right positions therefore you just need a robot to do the the easy tasks on it okay so in that case it will save you a lot of um, uh, other money on getting the positioners and other wish sensors visions or whatever to make that kind of uh, decision so therefore we still use a lot of industrial automations like conveyor okay to detect maybe certain height and to orientate it before we fit it to the industrial robot to operate so if you are you already have a, a line that uh, operate in this way then shifting to industrial robot may be uh, an easier task okay then also in frequency change over you may want have a less change over okay in between them then robots also will do a good job on it okay so here is another the calculations of the cycle time and the production rate okay very simple equations that you can do it based on your common sense right so the t the cycle time is equals to all the times collectively okay that involve assembly work handling right and the tools handling right so three things add them up together would be your cycle time to complete the the whole product right whereas for the average production rate it's just a reciprocal of this uh, uh, cycle time for one cycle okay how long it takes per piece okay this piece is piece okay how long it takes to make one piece right so for the production rate you just re uh, reciprocal of it okay 60 minutes okay divide by your your cycle time that you will get how many units of product you can produce per hour so this uh, production rate is an average uh, and based on the assumptions that your downtime is not counted or the number of quantities that you produce is much more longer the time to produce or the time for productions is much more longer than the setup time Okay, if you always have a change over changing tools, resetting up, okay, then uh, this average production rate will drop. Okay, you have to consider uh, the setup time as well if you always doing that setup, right? But if it it the production uh, time may takes maybe one month, okay, the setup time may be one hour, then then the average rate may not much being affected right come to the robot programming part okay you still can't run away from programming <laughs> okay i would say but then uh in this uh, robot programs is actually to define the path uh follow by that should be followed by the manipulator your robotic arm itself okay with coordination with your peripheries uh, so-called actions and device okay you have a positional your peripheral actions will include like uh, turning on the spot welding okay pinch 
to the spark okay and and so on so that are your peripheral action so this robot program you will covers all these uh, works okay instead of only manipulating it to the specific uh, positions or orientations right there are several uh, way to do it okay the easiest one yeah the most conservative one is through the limit switch okay you just put several limit switch when it touch this point then second second operations or sequence will come into pictures okay but then come to a higher level of programming then we would a more complex type of task then we would want to use these three main programming methods for robots okay so for robots they are usually based on these three main programming methods the first one would be the lead through programming as you heard this uh, terms before remember I have written there manual lead through okay so that is me means by lead through programming what it means by lead through is that you use human to lead your robot okay and you program it okay according to what you you lead okay so in this picture itself it's actually they are doing a lead through programming where this operator or programmer okay or what whoever it is okay will use a teach pattern okay they just control the robots to do a certain things and they will tell the robot to record these positions then move it then tell the robot this is the position to save okay so you will have several points okay to play back later on therefore you come to the to the terms called playback with point to point or maybe play playback with continuous path so you may want to program it okay just uh, manually lead through it okay through the cell through the work piece okay so make sure everything is correct then you save okay this point to this point draw a straight line okay and so on so this is how you do the lead through programming but the only things uh, the limitation is that it have a uh, limited uh, in terms of decisions making logic so in the teach pattern itself you may not able to do much on the if else and other things okay you just have to do move here okay do this move here do this and so on and also you need to stop your productions in order for you to teach the robot okay meaning to say at that particular point uh, you have to stop your whole productions now you start to teach okay saving points or path okay before you play it back okay so that is the disadvantage right whereas for the other two uh, programming methods you don't need to stop your operations you can program on your computer at your home especially nowadays work from home you program it from your home save it send to the robot and run whenever they are ready right so you don't need to stop your production line okay that switching of the program is very fast okay but then this lead through programming is more I would say safe because you can visually see okay how it is okay whereas for the computer like robot programming language you may use C C++ or whatever command that they have okay they have certain kind of uh, computer language right actually for this kind of uh, for this kind of manipulator and this kind of manipulator behind it again is a microprocessor and that microprocessor actually being built by manufacturers that has been in the industrial automations for many years and their commands are basically very similar to the PLC command right that's it that is the hint okay behind that programming language right then for the offline programming again it can be in the forms of a uh, do it at home you may have a simulator you have a cat software sorry a cat cam software nowadays okay cat cam software where you draw your cat model you can simulate the 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 path the nc path okay to program it offline then send it back right so that's those are the three uh way to program your robots next would be the robot accuracy and rapid 
repeatability that you may want to consider that includes the control resolutions uh, repeatability and accuracy so for the control resolutions is re represent the when you send a signal okay every single maybe especially in the digital you have the bit right so this bits actually uh, being limited because you if you let's say use a 10 bit uh, po program controller okay 10 bit controller so your signal is in the 10 bit so you have a resolution of 1024 only okay if your angle is 90 degree okay your joint allows 90 degree angles then this 90 degree angles divide by 1024 number of bit okay to represent the 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 step okay that you can you can have along this 90 degrees uh yeah this 90 degree angles therefore you can see there is a uh, resolutions okay between one one point one step to the other step all right so that we call that as a uh, control resolutions right that also may the next one would be the rep repeatability okay which is a measure of the robot ability to position the end of the wrist at the previously thought point okay in your work volume so this would related to the mechanical error now okay it's because you have put it there okay you may program from point a to point b all right but then every time it, it moves because of the maybe your gear have a backlash remember you have this mechanical error itself so the backlash will create that kind of uh, error okay when you repeat it right so we can represent that uh, repeatability as a plus minus three to the standard error of your of your mechanical error right so you just repeat it okay that particular you have a normal normally distributed curve okay so that uh, standard deviations okay three deviations of it okay that with your repeatability then for the accuracies this is the ability to for the manipulator or your robots to positions the end of the wrist at the desired locations of your work volume okay therefore if you want to deal with that you just have to add them up so called yes yeah, sort of like adding up okay the CR the control resolution divided by 2 plus the 3 uh, Sigma okay that would give you or as give you yeah estimate the accuracy of your robots okay So there is a question, okay, is there any organizations that will handle the inspections or manufacture itself do their own inspections of robots? Uh, yes, actually, uh, not only the manufacturer, I would say uh, it's a support company instead of a manufacturer because manufacturer usually only deal with the industrial robot itself okay the arm and so on they will produce this kind but then the integrations there there are companies that provide this integrations uh, service okay where they will see your needs okay they will purchase the suitable or recommend the suitable uh, industrial robots for you besides that they will uh, actually propose if you want to do inspections they may create that kind of inspections uh, robots in the Cartesian type or whatever it is specifically for your product okay they are very specific so because of that specific nature uh, this kind of uh, service are actually being provided provided by not manufacturer themselves but then is provided by the service the integrator service provider okay so this integrator service provider usually is a company like a uh, mechatronics company dealing with a lot of mechatronics okay you can find it uh, very common in uh, peninsular Malaysia. okay there are companies in in Penang, Johor and Selangor I believe three of these major industry hubs okay they have companies that actually able to design uh, according to your needs okay so what you need 
is later on to select the proper sensor okay this kind of inspections mainly based on the industrial automations technique that you do not not really on the robot itself okay unless uh, you may need a specific uh, specific flexibility okay or specific task that normal machines may not be able to orientate therefore you may want to locate your robots using a vision sensor okay always go through maybe certain parts of your engine block or whatever it is okay much more difficult right but other than that uh, usually they are organizations instead of manufacturer okay doing their own inspections of the robots oh for the inspection of the robots uh, again yeah they are integrators okay that will helps you to install external sensors okay all the robot manufacturer that we do the servicing they will do the calibrations and so on right so i hope that would answer your questions right then come to the maybe a i guess the last sections okay about the robot kinematics okay just a brief idea of uh, robot kinematics for the industrial robots okay this kinematics is what you have learned uh, in the mechanics okay it's just a study of the relative motions in terms of displacement velocity and accelerations okay With respect to the to the positions variable all right so they are two two type of kinematics one is uh, forward kinematics and the second one will be the inverse kinematics so here you can see the relationship is that this would be the normal normal space that we know right you may tell the coordinates okay the cartesian space when we intend to convert this cartesian space because remember your robotic arm have six degree of freedom let's say okay in terms of if you want the robot to move to point a with coordinate one two three let's say okay then your robots have to translate it into a joint space okay they will have to tell for every single degree of freedom how many degree okay they should turn okay in order to reach this particular point the end effector have can be able to reach this particular point we we call that as an inverse kinematic all right from this in a uh, joint space later on you can easily convert to the actuator actuator space meaning to say if joint number one want to turn 30 degree then your actuator actuator space meaning to say your motor will tells will be able to know how many turns you have to rotate in order to achieve this this certain angle right so this is the inverse directions whereas for, for the forward kinematics is from the lower sections okay from the actuator space okay to the joint space if i put 30 degree for joint one 20 degree for joint two 40 degree for joint three and so on what is the locations of the of the end effector that you will reach okay that would be the forward kinematics so this is the 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 positional kinematics that we will uh, briefly go through today right so for the forward kinematics itself um, you can see that uh, it is useful in the sense that it tells you where the where the end effector or the two mountings would be okay respect to your coordinate system right so you have to do all this uh, forward kinematics okay in order to know where it is located by a given uh, join right so this is how you can orient check your positions okay Be why you would want to know this kind of uh, positions i would say pose here which includes positions and orientation is because even though in in real life we have a lot of advanced sensors but those sensors still have their limitations and again very expensive therefore uh, we would 
use the cheapest ideal case right to actually calculate based on our knowledge okay to tell us what is the location okay if we know all the angles of the joint then we can tell where is the location of it okay instead of depending on the sensors maybe external sensors to tell exactly where is the locations of the end right so that would be more troublesome or complex to deal with okay so this forward kinematics is still widely used okay in the robot control uh, in the sense of uh, feedback control right so you must tell you must be able to feedback and tells this location is not correct right until you reach the certain positions okay that can be achieved through we call it a transformation matrix okay so this transformation matrix is a four by four matrix okay four by four matrix okay transforming from one one joins to the next join right uh, it has been introduced uh, long time back okay and then there is uh, this Danovitz Hattenberg conventions which actually helps to to form this transformation matrix much more easier okay in this uh, DH conventions is you will only require four parameter instead of uh, six to define the whole six degree of freedom okay so you just have to tell four parameters okay in order to 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 transform around your three-dimensional space okay usually in this four parameter itself three of the parameters are already fixed okay either by the link parameter the length of your parameters and so on and the last parameter would be your join variables okay so they are f these four parameters that you usually want to do okay so Again, uh, the formations of this uh, dynamite Hattenberg, if you are interested, you can always uh, check to in the robotic books uh, by Craig, right? So this is the, the dynamite Hattenberg frame assignments, and this is the relationship between previous frame to the next frame, okay? This is the coordinate, all right? So you can theta one, alpha one okay then you have the d one okay and the a one right so four parameters okay that the, that tells the whole transformation matrix right so these are the 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 four parameters and then f since you have uh, multiple joints okay in order to to know the final coordinates you can transform by post multiply okay from frame number zero to frame number one, one to two, two to three, and so on until the end. Okay, but now multiply all these matrices. Okay, all these multi, these four by four matrices. Then you will get the final transformation matrix. So if you intend to put certain angles, okay, then you will get that particular output at at your at your position as your positions. Sorry. Okay. For the inverse kinematics uh, case, it would be slightly more uh, tricky, right? I would say slightly more tricky. It depends on the configurations of your robot, all right? If in the case of this robot, okay, which is a spherical with a, 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 rob a robot with a spherical wrist, then we can actually decouple decouple the operation into positions and orientations okay we can separate them together and the solutions would be the positions of your robot based on the trigonometric uh, relations okay trigonometric relations and the orientations which mainly deal with the wrist orientations so this wrist orientation is the is the solutions for for the orientations the joint angle at the wrist itself so this is the solutions between them right so when we combine them together eh, sorry this is the solution between them so this c and s that i've used here referring to the cosine of angle theta number five cosine for theta number six cosine for 
theta number 7 okay join number 7 and so on right so when you put it in this r7 to r frame 4 to frame number 7 that will tells you the the rotational matrix okay from for these solutions okay whereas this one would be uh, at these positions right so this is how you can uh, break them up into 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 two sections okay you solve it by the arm sub assembly and the second one is the wrist assembly all right so basically if you solve for all the all the possible solutions at the end one particular point okay let's say I want point uh, coordinate one two three with orientations uh, a B C all right so given this kind of pose actually you have eight solutions right in this case right so this uh, spherical uh, robot so that's why I would say the inverse kinematics would be a little bit, bit tricky depending on the on the robot configuration itself all right so you have to play around with the trigonometry relations as well as the transformation in the, of it all right so this is how I've uh, program it all right so you can see um, the robot itself you can program it all right through so that I can change the angle okay put into the 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 into the program all right so that would define the matrix behind it so that I can actually tell when angle change what is the final positions and at the final position what would be the angle okay I would I would do both both sides itself okay so that would include maybe the arc length and other things okay and this is also uh, to illustrate uh, even in the program itself when you generate the solutions you have this kind of control resolutions the CR pro problem remember previously he, because even uh, I've assigned with the oh, what type of variables I forgot the uh, float float type of variables okay the system itself when they generate the solutions they they still have that kind of uh, small error okay as compared to maybe in the system I may have a pure zero positions okay but then the system may generate uh, 0 0.0012 okay to the power of negative 10 okay so these are the 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 type of join error okay when I manipulate from minus 100 degree to I think 780 degree all right for that particular angle so that is the solutions uh, generated okay and I compare with the theoretical value so you can see that there is still a very small okay to the power of minus 12 to 13 okay which is somehow negligible right so this is how you can see those kind of uh, small errors occurs okay or resolutions problem so this is another uh, apart from that uh, we have uh, this program to generate or interpolate the straight lines okay to do the welding right in the straight lines okay and how this can be achieved is that uh, I have the trajectory trajectory planning okay so if I would want to do a welding on a straight line okay from point one to point two what I would do is that I would put a certain point in between okay so that it would break them into a straight line okay so this would be a shorter length okay so if these two lines is still too far then I can add an additional midpoint in between them okay so this midpoint uh, actually is I have a certain idea behind it okay why I need this I call it wire point in between okay wire point in between it because uh, in the algorithm that I do in the trajectory planning actually 
I try to avoid the the touch okay crashing with the workpiece okay so there are certain angle that I may need to maintain the certain pose so that particular pose as you can see why I break them here is that this point to this point the pose of the touch is over there right pointing towards that side whereas the pose on this side I'm pointing towards the other side okay therefore in between them I put a mid pose or orientation of the torch okay in between them so in between even on a straight line I have uh, put a wire point so that the pose itself being orientated okay the torch is being orientated so that it creates not only a straight line but the torch itself will be able to move and avoid the clashing with the workpiece right so this is uh, the the so-called tra trajectory planning that we can program it uh, on your our own okay based on the knowledge right so that would come to the end so this is the articles that I've uh, read okay at the end of last year where they do a survey saying that nine out of ten Malaysians see the needs of reskill and upskill in the post pandemic market so what it means by reskill is that if you work long enough in the industry it is time to reskill to learn a new skill okay then also uh, upskill is uh, you already have a knowledge of certain skill you would want to upgrade the skill itself okay to a higher level so there is a need to it okay because in the survey they said 80 percent of the survey saying or believe that companies will prefer hiring people who can perform multiple functions again this is the reason why the reason why you need to reskill and upskill okay well uh, 80 percent 83 percent of the employee actually will reduce their headcount by stepping up digital efforts okay when they transform into digital effort means your job is no longer essential right so when it's not essential then they can slowly phase it out right so reskill upskill is very important okay therefore as I've mentioned previously uh, just if you don't like programming just learn something right because I would believe a uh, digital programming will become more and more important as a tool okay not uh, as a not as a skill but as a tool for you to process okay so this is one of the program again that I have developed in in Korea okay that even though very simple but it's actually helps okay me a lot okay even my let me a lot okay because this tool is a uh, is a uh, operations where I can put the task okay I automate the task okay such that I run the simulations that simulations may take six hours maybe 24 hours 23 hours we don't know okay so what we what I did is that I do this uh, program such that everyone can can do a, put a queue of tasks okay after they they so-called create the the simulations okay because that simulations we can program okay and put it into tasks so you just queue not KILL but queue queue uh, barbaris right so queue the the put into queue okay the task so that once uh, simulation done then they will start the second one automatically right because uh, time is uh, important there right if with this uh, program actually I I can sleep better okay why because uh, most of the simulations may stop in the midnight if I have 20 simulations to run within 10 days so actually actually I may have to always check okay whether the the si previous simulation have finished or not if finished then I have to run the next one so this program will help me to do this automatically right so I just free from that I don't have to wake up at 2 midnight to check 3 midnight to check that's like 
the my lab meet previously done without this program okay so this is where uh, programs is very useful as a tool to help you to increase your your productivity or, or so on okay so that would end the the cost okay for this okay and don't forget about the lab assignment then please provide your feedback as well to the Google Classroom then we will start to plan for test 2 and 3 uh, in the in the Google Classroom and finally uh, we will have the even though you don't have the final exam don't forget the PK07 right okay so there is a question from Stanley about the program can take result from Abacus uh, the program that I did uh, cannot take result from Abacus because in Abacus uh, it very dependent on the on your model okay your cat model so the point of the point of uh, measurements the point of measurements are different okay in your abacus okay CA, CA unless you are doing a program such that you would want to run it maybe hundred times okay but with different parameter then yes uh, you can actually take result okay by putting a certain parameter okay because in the in the abacus when they actually support Python okay so you can use Python to to search across your data right so I have seen uh, some codings uh, that they use Python to grab certain data and from that data they they somehow use it to to program the next step okay because in Abacus you may deal with a uh, if a static case you may not need to deal with uh, this kind of problem but then when certain cases like uh, the code that I have uh, read previously they are actually doing a professor in US okay which I uh, talked to him and he shared the code with me and I checked the code itself they are doing a laser ab ablation meaning to say they are simulating a laser uh, trying to cut a, a hole okay so what happened is that this laser at certain temperature when the element itself reach certain temperature then the final element model will remove that particular elements okay this is how they can simulate uh, the 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 delete the yeah the ab ablations of the laser itself okay by removing the material so therefore they can actually read through uh, MATLAB okay you can also use MATLAB to program it uh, such that you query the the data file okay using Python once you get the results you read check whether that result have maybe the temperature have reach certain value or not all right so in order to get this one actually uh, there is one trick okay instead of uh, query the whole result file every time you can uh, add a line into your CAE uh, code okay your CAE I forgot the name of the, the, the file itself okay when you create that CAE file the yeah the analysis file itself you can add a line that uh, ask them to display this unit for you okay meaning to say you store this value separately in a certain file okay once you store it separately in the certain file then every time you just open this file and read it right so that is the read yeah reading reading files technique right just like you uh, learn you have learned this in the C programming right? reading reading values from a file okay so you can create a simple text file from there okay and read it so I hope that answers your questions and that ends our our lectures for today. Okay. So my final advice I guess this would be the last 
lecture for you all guys okay so you will only grow old when you stop learning so if you don't want to grow old keep learning right so I still keep learning right so that's all for me if you still have any questions I open for it before we call this uh, course to an end any more questions if no questions um, then uh, I would put some tentative date on the on the Google Classroom ah I forgot there is also quiz all right so the quiz I will put it on next week right so there is quiz there is feedback and then we will also start to plan for test 2 and test 3 all right so you can also propose your your date for test 2 and test 3 all right so that uh, we can work around that because I also know that you have other assignments and the FYP coming coming through all right so we try to do as soon as possible so that you have uh, more time for other things right so you let me know if you have any more questions in the Google Classroom right so I hope uh, you enjoy this course and learn something from that okay so that's all from me and I would say thank you for being with me for two years when the quiz 2 will be released quiz 2 will be next Monday okay so quiz 2 topic will cover up to I think cover up to this this particular lecture okay that's why I didn't put it up on the first right so they will just simple questions that you can you can look okay from the notes itself okay you don't have any more subject offer in next sem uh, for next sem I think I would not offer any elective so in that case no very unlikely I will meet you okay well yeah very unlikely I will meet you unless you want to repeat my subject <laughs> okay so yeah no more cost for elective from me okay so if no more questions then that's all from my side okay so always keep in touch okay any things you need just uh, whatsapp me I know you have my whatsapp right okay so that's all from me okay see you again and have a pleasant semester okay bye bye